thumb up, so I think we can start. So good afternoon, everybody, and uh, welcome to the first uh, afternoon session of this conference. So my name is Valentina, and I will have the pleasure to uh, chair this session that is uh, a bit of a special session. So let's uh, also thank the organizers for uh, hosting it. Uh, that is called the quantum session, and that, as you will see, will have perhaps a bit more of a physics flavor uh, with respect to uh, the other talks of the conference. So we are going to have three talks. Uh, today. So the first one is more about uh, machine learning, as you see, so introduction to reinforcement learning and uh, perhaps applications to uh, problems of uh, quantum control. Uh, and then we will have two uh, talks after, uh, after this one, which maybe have to do more with uh, high dimensional statistics in some sense. So they will uh, we will hear a lot about concepts of uh, free probability and how this structure emerges when you uh, want to compute uh, higher order correlations between uh, matrix elements of uh, objects which uh, will emerge uh, from application to quantum problems. So we will see examples which come uh, both from out of equilibrium quantum physics and from problems of equilibrium quantum physics and, uh, and thermalization. So I didn't ask uh, permission to the speakers, but I think they will be happy to be interrupted uh, during the talks. So if there are questions, comments, please uh, feel free to ask. I think the more this is interactive and uh, the better it is for, uh, for everybody. So having said this, uh, we can introduce uh, our first speaker of today, who is Marin Bukov, who is research group leader at the Max Planck Institute in Dresden, uh, Max Planck Institute for the Physics of Complex Systems. And as I said, he will give us an introduction to reinforcement learning and applications to uh, problems of quantum control. So Marine, Thanks, Valley, please. For, for the nice introduction. I hope you guys can all hear me uh, well. OK, yeah, so uh, anytime you have a question, just uh, raise your hand or just shout out loud. Uh, it's better to you know, have the questions answered than uh, me clicking through a bunch of slides. Um, so what I decided to tell you about today um, is um, about what we do uh, in my group um, and how we use reinforcement learning uh, for quantum control. And as I was preparing these slides, I realized that many of you will probably not be familiar with reinforcement learning nor with quantum control. And so I decided to turn the whole uh, uh, presentation into more like of an introduction to this. Um, and so it's going to be like a, more like a couple of definitions and then how we do things there. Um, and then towards the end, there will be also the um, examples. Okay. Um, so as the title suggests, um, I need to explain to you what reinforcement learning is um, and what quantum control is. Um, so we will start with, uh, um, with a definition of reinforcement learning and kind of an you know, intuitive definition how one could think about it if one wanted to. Then we'll go a little bit more formal and uh, I'll try to set up the reinforcement learning framework. So we'll define um, uh, the mathematical framework behind it. We'll discuss one uh, set of algorithms, the policy gradient algorithms, because they're very easy and um, I think at least intuitive to understand by physicists. And then uh, in the last part of the talk, we'll talk about applications uh, for reinforcement learning um, to qubit control, um, which is the simplest um, of quantum systems you can imagine. Okay. <clears throat> So as you, I'm sure, are familiar with, uh, there are three main branches of modern machine learning. Uh, on the one hand, there's supervised learning. On the other hand, there's unsupervised learning. And then there's reinforcement learning. And all these three branches are essentially um, thought of as uh, being on equal footing. Um, so let me just uh, recap for you what we mean by those. Uh, let me start with supervised learning. So supervised learning can be defined intuitively as learning from examples or learning from labeled data. And there are two main branches of supervised learning. There are classification tasks or classification problems and regression problems. And maybe the most familiar example um, that uh, I'm sure everyone here has heard of uh, is the MNIST digit classification problem. So you're given a set of handwritten um, digits, and the idea is to construct a machine learning model which learns to classify uh, these images. So that's an example of supervised learning problem. Um, in many body physics, uh, supervised learning is actually used to classify phases of matter um, or to determine, to determine critical points um, based on, on examples. So uh, if you go back to your statistical mechanics class uh, and you recall what the uh, Ising model is, you may remember that in two dimensions, the Ising model has a critical point as a function of temperature, where if temperature is uh, low, this is here uh, what's on the x-axis, so this is temperature. If temperature is low, then the states are magnetized. So this is supposed to be like a, a, an Ising configuration. Everything is basically magnetized. Whereas when the temperature is very high, then the system is uh, disordered. And so what people have done using, uh, using supervised learning is to um, uh, teach a neural network to classify these images um, based on um, um, uh, training data 
taken deep in one and deep in the other phase, and then tried to extrapolate the position of the critical point as, as shown here. So that's one example of how we use supervised learning um, in many body physics. <clears throat> Um, now let's go to unsupervised learning. Unsupervised learning um, is about learning the structure of unlabeled data, or in other words, learning the distribution um, of the data. And one um, specific example that I want to highlight here in uh, quantum physics are the so-called neural quantum states. Um, in neural quantum states, the idea is, is, is very simple. So recall from your quantum mechanics one lecture, the so-called variational principle. In the variational principle, you parameterize the wave function using some unknown parameters theta. For instance, it can be a Gaussian wave function or an exponential wave function whatsoever. And then you have a Hamiltonian. And what you do is you compute the energy as a function of these parameters theta. And then you minimize this energy, determining the optimal value of these parameters. So that's the basics behind the uh, variational approach. Now, what does it have to do with uh, um, machine learning? Well, the idea is now that you can use a more complicated ansatz for the wave function. Instead of using just you know, a simple Gaussian or another simple function that you can come up with, you can use an actual neural network. So now, the weights and the biases of this neural network are actually the variational parameters. And what you do again, um, well, sorry, this is not really displayed properly, but what you do is eventually is, is you minimize um, the energy. Uh, in doing so, you are finding the optimal weights and biases of your neural network. So this is how you're doing your um, optimization. But of course, this can be done not just to find ground states. It can also be done um, um, to uh, time-evolved states. And in particular, when you have complicated many-body systems with many degrees of freedom, having such an expressive ansatz um, is actually helpful. And uh, why is this unsupervised learning? Well, because the way it works is you're actually trying to learn the wave function, which is kind of, you know, the square of it will be a proper distribution, right? So you're trying to learn distribution. And the learning process, uh, you actually sample from this distribution. Okay, so all of this is very nice, but this is actually not what I want to talk about today. Instead, I want to talk about reinforcement learning. And reinforcement learning is different from supervised and unsupervised learning because reinforcement learning is learning from experience. Now, if you've never heard about reinforcement learning before, and um, you know, I had to explain it to you in just one sentence, then uh, I would say that reinforcement learning is the mathematically formal way to teach your dog to sit. So how do you teach your dog to sit? You know, uh, you say sit 50 times, and maybe by chance once or twice out of these 50 times, the dog, the dog actually sits, right? But when it does so, you actually give it a treat, right? So you reinforce a certain behavior. And this is actually the main concept, the main idea behind reinforcement learning. And as I'll show you in a couple of slides, you know, um, the rest of it is basically formal mathematics. So how to make it work um, um, in, in, uh, in a more scientific way. So let me uh, then uh, go a little bit more into uh, examples of reinforcement learning and what can be done uh, with it, um, and it's in particular what has been done in the last couple of years um, that, was, uh, uh, that, that attracted the attention of other people and also myself. Um, so I want to show an example um, of, uh, uh, of a game, um, uh, of a video game and an agent that was trained by Google DeepMind. Fortunately, the reference is cut out. It's here in the bottom. Um, and so what Google did is um, they, they took this game of breakout, um, and then they tried to teach a, a reinforcement learning agent to play the game as best as, as, as it can. Um, how many of you are familiar with this game? OK, the majority of you. So maybe I should very briefly explain uh, for those of you who haven't seen it. So you have, a, you have a pad, you have a ball, and then you have a brick wall here. And the idea is to basically, uh, with the pad, you catch the ball. Um, and then the ball can bounce off the pad. It can also bounce off the walls. And whenever the ball hits a brick, then it destroys a brick, and you get a point. Right? And so the idea is you, know, you destroy all the bricks, you get all the points, you maximize the score, uh, and then you win the game, or you pass to the next level. However, it can also happen that the ball falls below this horizon here. Uh, and when it falls below the horizon, uh, then it's game over. Um, and, and then you have to start over um, again. So what Google DeepMind did was they taught a reinforcement learning agent to play this game, except it did, uh, they didn't really tell it uh, at all what it's doing, right? So the agent has no information about you know, what is a ball, what is a, what is a pad, what is a brick. Uh, any, any of these were not given. Uh, the agent was only given uh, the pixels um, from the screen. Right? And then it uh, tries through this trial and error approach um, uh, to become better and better. So let me show you the, the movie of this training uh, uh, process. As you can see in the beginning, the agent is fairly dumb, right? Like essentially, it always misses. But if you pay attention, you'll see that every now and then, it's actually going to hit the ball twice in a row. And this means that there's actually some correlation that you know, this learning algorithm picks up. So if you now train it for about two hours, you'll see that it already uh, plays like an expert. So it never misses, basically. Um, at this level, uh, you, know, uh, you would say that uh, you've achieved everything you want. You just 
you know, wait long enough, um, and then it's going to go to the next level. But if you actually keep training it for a little bit longer, say for two more hours, then you'll see that you'll find a fairly uh, interesting solution. One solution that those of you who actually played the game may, might know, um, but a solution that is a little bit non-trivial. So uh, it's gonna punch a hole uh, through the wall, as you see, and then it's gonna get the, uh, um, the maximum amount of score in the shortest amount of time. I'm losing my pointer for whatever reason. Okay, so that's the, uh, uh, you know, the basic idea behind reinforcement learning now is you see this, you know, and you're maybe a quantum physicist, what you ask yourself is, can you actually make use of this um, uh, to actually solve some physics problems? And this is what I wanna uh, be talking about today. But before we get there, uh, just the following year, there was another breakthrough, so some of you might say, well, games are kind of fun, but you know, they're not that scientific in some sense, right? Uh, but it turns out that you can actually use reinforcement learning to find very well, strategies in very complicated board games. So this is the game of Go, um, where uh, Google DeepMind's agent uh, ultimately defeated the uh, world human champion. If you don't know what Go is, you can just think of chess. So this is a board game with exponentially many configurations, uh, and there's actually a strategy that's not so um, um, easy to find, especially when you're playing against a human. But still, you can say, okay, still games, right? We wanna do science. Uh, if you fast forward a couple of years, this is a work from last year um, where um, the, uh, these guys managed to train a reinforcement learning agent to control the dynamics of a plasma inside a tokamak. So this is already going more uh, the direction uh, a physical system. Uh, the interesting thing here is that you have a very complex physical system and what you want to do is, and you don't know exactly how it behaves, like you can maybe try to model it, writing down some um, equations of motion for the plasma dynamics. Um, but overall, um, you know, we know that this is a, a, an unsolved problem. And they actually trained an agent um, um, to, 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 to uh, hold the plasma for as long as, uh, as it can. I wanna say right away that this has been done in a simulator, so this has not yet been you know, deployed in, in, you know, uh, in, in an actual uh, uh, tokamak. But you know, who knows, maybe in the next 10 years they're actually gonna be able to do that. But this is a session on quantum physics, and we wanna go quantum. Um, and uh, what I want to, in, in the end, get to, towards the end of the talk, is applications of reinforcement learning for quantum technologies. And just in case I don't get there, I just wanna list them here. Um, so the most uh, intuitive application that you can think of is quantum control. So reinforcement learning is trying to manipulate, it's trying to find strategies, it's ultimately trying to control uh, systems, right? And if we have quantum systems, the question is how do we control them? But it can also be used for quantum error correction. Um, this uh, is something that's uh, at the core of uh, reliable quantum computing. This is something that we don't have yet, um, but is uh, you know, a very desirable, desirable feature that if you would get one day, uh, then you would actually have like a proper quantum computer that you can exploit in the same way that you have classical, quantum, uh, classical computers. So quantum error correction is an important unsolved problem and people uh, are using uh, reinforcement learning for it. One can also use it for quantum gate design. So um, again, uh, um, you know, part of quantum, uh, um, of, of quantum physics or quantum research these days is how to design uh, gates. So these are operations on the quantum computer. And usually what you have to do is you have to apply some pulses there. You can use reinforcement learning to find the optimal form of these pulses, the functional form of these pulses. Um, and last but not least, um, you can also use it to design uh, these quantum circuits. So basically to design how to interact with, with such a quantum device. Okay. Any questions so far? No, so let's uh, then move. So when should you consider using reinforcement learning, right? So let's say that you have a problem sitting in front of you on your desk and then you're thinking about it and you say, should I use reinforcement learning there or not? Well, I just wanna mention three um, the main advantages that reinforcement learning can give you. The first one is that it is model free. What this means is that it doesn't require the concept of a model, the same way that that agent was playing without knowing what a ball is and what a brick is, et cetera. It's capable through this trial and error to actually uh, extract relevant information for solving the task. It doesn't mean that it will learn what the ball is in the process. Maybe it doesn't have to learn what a ball is, right? Maybe it can just solve the task without that, but it, will, it doesn't require any concept, so it's model free. Second, it's adaptive. And what this means is that you can train your agent on one system, but then you know, there's the agent afterwards that's left over out of this process. And you can apply it you know, to another system and see how well it's going to do. And if the two systems are not completely different, then uh, there's a good chance that you'll actually know to do something with it. And uh, yeah, this is also kind of quite intuitive. You know, maybe uh, you know, if you know how to drive a car, you can also learn how to drive a truck fairly easily, but you won't be able to fly a plane, right? Uh, so these are essentially the, uh, the ideas. And last but not least, it's autonomous, and this is particularly appealing if you're an experimentalist, because then you can basically run reinforcement learning in your experiment and you can go for a coffee. 
right? Uh, you don't have to uh, worry about that. Okay. So uh, with this, uh, I am coming to the end of the intro, and now I want to go a little bit more into the mathematical details of how reinforcement learning works. Okay, so if something now becomes unclear, then you should stop and you should, um, you should ask. So overall, in the reinforcement learning, we have an agent that learns how to solve a task by, interact, uh, by interaction with its environment. So what the agent does um, um, is it takes an action out of some available actions. Think of you know, the position of the pad, right? So it can move left, right, or let it stay. Upon this action, the environment will change the state. So in this case, the state of the environment is essentially the pixels of the screen. And if you want to be a little bit pedantic, then you have to take the pixels of the screen at two time slices. Um, but this is a detail we can discuss uh, offline if you're interested in. So the state will change, right? The pixels will move somehow. Um, and then there's a reward that's fed back to the agent, right? So the, what the agent can do is it can observe the state, but it also gets a reward. And the reward is whether you, know, you destroyed the brick or not, whether you got a point or you didn't get a point. And based on this information, the agent is now going to choose another action, right? And so this thing repeats over and over again uh, uh, until the game comes to an end. And the game can come to an end if you win, or it can come to an end um, if, the, if the ball falls below the horizon, right? At this stage, the game restarts, and you start training over and over again. So this is the so-called reinforcement learning feedback loop. So it's a feedback loop um, optimization uh, framework. Okay, so a little bit more rigorously, um, we need to define, in order to cast a problem into uh, a reinforcement learning framework, we need to define a, an action space, a state space, and a reward space. So the action space is the set of the available actions. In this case, this is you know, move left, move right, or stay. Then there's the state space. This is the set of pixelized images of the screen. And then there's the reward. And the reward is uh, plus one if you destroy a brick um, over here, um, and zero uh, if you don't. And reinforcement learning in its core is a Markov decision process. So I want to recall for you what a Markov process is first. Um, I'm sure that you've seen uh, somewhere in your undergraduate courses like such a Markov chain where you have states here at a given time step. So there's time steps t, t plus 1, t plus 2, and then there's states st, st plus 1, and st plus 2. And a Markov chain is a chain where you transition with the probability p um, from state st to state st plus 1. And here's an important thing. Now, the Markov property means that this transition probability depends only on the previous state, right, and not on the history. Now, reinforcement learning is a bit more than a Markov process. It's a Markov decision process. And what this means is that, that this transition probability will depend not just on the previous state, but also on the action chosen. Please. Correct, yes. Uh, so this is actually a, a, a very important problem in reinforcement learning. Like formally, in this case, you cannot just apply reinforcement learning. Without a reward, it just won't work. But there is something which is called meta-learning and which people are uh, looking into. It's just very difficult. They are essentially trying to learn what is there to be learned. Exactly. That's why it's called meta-learning. Um, I don't know, to be honest, what the state of the art is right now in that field, but I know that it's, it's being considered, but it's very difficult. So you need to know at least what you want to do. Any other questions? Yes. Okay, thanks. Uh, yes, so one thing that you should know about this transition probability is that it contains basically the laws of physics. So this is written in stone, you know. Uh, you can't change the laws of physics, right? So this is always there. What you can change, though, is how you select the actions. So there's another probability here, which is denoted by pi, and that's the probability to take an action A being in the state S. And this probability is also known as policy or strategy, if you uh, find it more intuitive. Uh, and this is the actual object of reinforcement learning. So reinforcement learning is about learning the policy, learning the probability pi to take an action A from the state ST. Okay? And then, of course, you know, once you transition to the state ST plus 1, there is also the reward um, um, RT plus 1 that is given there. All right. 
So the objective now in reinforcement learning is to find that policy. You want to you know, become better and better at playing the game, so you want to be taking better and better actions. You want to find the policy which maximizes the total expected return. So this is the sum of all rewards that you got along the trajectories, averaged over many trajectories that you played. That's the reinforcement learning objective. OK, so now we know what reinforcement learning is. Let's see how to construct an algorithm. And I'll show you something that hopefully will be quite intuitive. Um, so again, here's the objective. What we want um, is we want to evaluate this expectation value. But of course, this is expectation value over, over these trajectories here um, that we just uh, um, saw, right? And you know, there's infinitely many or exponentially many trajectories. So you cannot compute this expectation value exactly. And instead, what you do is you sample trajectories, and then you approximate this um, uh, expectation value. So that's the first thing that we can do. Then, in order to improve the policy, what we can think of first is we can parameterize it using some variational parameters theta. So that's similar to what I showed you a couple of slides um, back. And now that we've, very, uh, now that we've parameterized the policy, um, in order to improve the uh, total expected return, all we need to do is we need to figure out the gradients uh, with respect to these parameters theta, right? So I have the policy, I parameterize it by, para by some parameters theta, um, and then I want to compute the gradient, and this is an expression here I'm showing you uh, how you can estimate the gradient from trajectories here on the, on the right. And the last step is very intuitive. You just want to do gradient ascent. So in this case, I'm maximizing the return. That's why I'm not going down the hill, but I am going up the hill in this parameter space. So this is the, the theta space. OK, so this is very, very intuitive. You're basically climbing up uh, the hill with this algorithm. So this is known as the policy gradient algorithm. Uh, and this is just the very, very basic, the most basic version of it. There are quite a bit more uh, sophisticated versions uh, that you're, if you're interested in, you can, uh, you can come ask me. But um, that's essentially uh, the simplest thing you can, um, you can write down. And that's, you know, or a more sophisticated version of this algorithm uh, was used uh, for the uh, plasma control problem. OK. Um, but we want to, as I said again, we want to discuss examples to quantum uh, physics. And now I want to show you how one can use this policy gradient algorithm in order to control uh, a single qubit. So for those of you uh, who are not uh, doing research in, 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 in quantum technologies or quantum uh, in general, uh, a qubit is just a two-level system. So that's the simplest possible quantum system that I hope uh, many, or if not all of you, have seen in, in quantum mechanics one. So you have a two-level system. Uh, um, you know, the Hilbert space has two states, 0 and 1. And what I'm showing you here uh, is essentially a representation of the, of the Hilbert space, the so-called block sphere. So any point on the block sphere uh, corresponds to one quantum state. And controlling quantum states of a single qubit means essentially moving arrows on, on the sphere. Okay? Now, how can you move, you know, these arrows on the sphere? Uh, well, you have to rotate them, right? And the rotations uh, in quantum mechanics it, are basically given by these gates. Um, so these are uh, exponentials of Pauli matrices at of some fixed angle uh, or time step delta t. And you can imagine that you can do rotations about the x, y, and z axis. Um, and in this case, I'm going to keep the rotation angle delta t uh, fixed but, um, um, but small. And what you want now, um, sorry, I, yeah, I forgot to say, what you want now from this problem is you want an agent that will initialize your qubit. So let's say that the qubit is initialized with state zero. That's the blue arrow. So you want that, you know, you start your you know, quantum device. You'll find it in some state pointing along any of these you know, directions given by the black arrows. And you want your agent to look at the state and then eventually apply these gates such that in the end you get to the, to the target state. So uh, you want to rotate you know, in a few steps. So these are the steps of the game, right? Such that in the end your state points up. Um, now, to do that, we have to you know, frame the, pro the problem using reinforcement learning. And the first thing we want is we want to define the states. So as I already mentioned, um, any state of a two-level system can be parameterized by a vector on the sphere. And we know that the vector on the sphere uh, in spherical coordinates has two angles, uh, theta and phi. Uh, and in you know, uh, terms of the complex, uh, well, two-dimensional complex Hilbert space, this uh, parameterization looks like that. So what this means is that the reinforcement learning state space here, uh, which is you know, uh, this block sphere, uh, is, the tuples, uh, is a space of tuples of angles theta and phi okay, um, on the sphere. Next, we want to define the actions. Um, the reinforcement learning actions are given by these gates, so the three rotations about x, y, and z axis. 
But also, I want to give it one more action, which is the identity. So basically, do nothing. The reason for this is, you know, if it happens to get to, to the target state already, um, I want it to basically be able to stay there and not keep, you know, drifting away. Okay, and every action is applied um, um, on the state by just applying the unitary on the corresponding quantum state psi. Out of this, you get a new state psi prime, and using this prescription up here, you can compute the corresponding S prime, so the, the, the new angles, theta prime and, and phi prime. And finally, we want the reward. So what do we want to do? Uh, we want to bring the state you know, to the North Pole. Um, so all you can do is, in this case, all you need to do is measure angles between the states, right? And you, know, you fix you know, a reference state, a target state in the North Pole. And if you're anywhere else, you know, any other state will have an angle with that state. What you want is you want to minimize that angle. And minimizing this angle is the same thing as maximizing the overlap with the target uh, state squared, right? At every given step, your uh, time-evolved physical state, qubit state psi t, um, will have an overlap with, with your target state, and you want to maximize this overlap. That's the same thing when I say maximizing the, the reward. Um, OK, and you know, we have to choose an algorithm. And in this case, um, we're going to be using the policy gradient algorithm that, uh, that I, just, uh, uh, I just defined. Um, OK. But so the reward here is given at every step, but of course you can consider situations where it's given only in the end. This was the case in the, uh, in the game of chess. You can only give a reward once you know whether you win or not. Um, okay. But there is a problem here. And the problem is that um, you know, the state space can be, or in this case, is actually continuous, right? So there are continuously many different arrows on, on that sphere. And if you want to do learning, you have to figure out how, how to control uh, from any of these, right? Uh, so you cannot just list, you know, make a table. So discretize, right, and then make a table of your sphere and then learn everything uh, uh, for these states in the table. You actually want to know, uh, also uh, be able to act from states in between. Um, and the question, you know, uh, boils down to the fact that the uh, state space has either exponentially many configurations or um, um, it has, you know, continue or it is continuous. Um, and what you want is you want to estimate the values of not yet encountered states. And you know, you guys know machine learning. Um, so uh, the way to do this is essentially to uh, define this variational approximation. So again, we come back to this variational approximation to the policy. Remember, the policy is the strategy with which I choose actions. So there are these variational parameters theta. Um, and very often um, in machine learning, these parameters theta are just the weights and the biases of some neural network. And here comes a lot of intuition that you might have about the problem, whether you want to use a fully connected neural network, whether you want to use maybe a convolutional neural network, maybe you want to use a graph neural network, a transformer, anything, right? In principle, can be put in there. Not anything will work equally well, right? Like problems, as you know, in, from physics have symmetries, and then you better make sure that your neural network architecture um, obeys these symmetries. And so in the end, um, what you're having for your agent or for your policy is a neural network where you plug in two numbers. These are, you know, th this is actually the, the, the reinforcement learning state or the values of the angle state and phi. And what you get out of it is, you know, a softmax layer, if you wish, or a probability for taking every one of the, of the four available actions. Okay? So you're learning essentially a probability distribution. Yeah, so this is a toy problem, right? I, I, I'm not saying that this is a difficult problem to solve. Maybe I should have, I should have mentioned this. This is just to, yeah. You, yeah, so usually problems are more, more complicated than this. They might have noise in, uh, in them. You might consider multiple qubits that interact somehow with one another or with an environment, yeah. Yeah, this is just for illustration. Any other question? Um, so there are different ways. Um, so um, that's actually a very good question because uh, Generically, quantum states are not measurable, right? So you cannot measure quantum states. But if you actually have uh, a, a single qubit, you can measure the x, y, and z, uh, Pauli x, Pauli y, and Pauli z operators. And if you know them, then you actually know your state. Yeah. But um, 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 it would be more appropriate to, to design a framework that doesn't really know about your state. And we can talk about it afterwards. There are ways to do this. I just don't want to go into, uh, into too many uh, uh, details. But this is, this, is, this is a very important point. A similar point, by the way, uh, is uh, whether you can get the reward at intermediate steps, because getting rewards at intermediate step means that you have to collapse your state. And once you collapse your state, you basically lose it. You have to start over again. So usually in these problems, we give the reward in the end. OK. 
All right, yeah, and then the last thing, as I said, is you know you have this neural network, and then you just use your favorite uh, uh, gradient uh, 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 or auto diff package uh, to compute the gradients and update the parameters uh, using this policy gradient update that uh, that we derived earlier. And yeah, and then that's it. You basically keep repeating this over and over again. Um, so uh, there is a Jupyter notebook uh, that I prepared uh, uh, some time ago. Uh, if you guys are interested, um, you can just you know, check it out on, on, on GitHub. So this is a code that uses JAX where I've basically coded up this policy gradient algorithm for this specific problem that, uh, um, that, that I show you. Okay, um, so now in the last 10, five minutes, <laughs> I can talk a little bit about other applications. 10 minutes, okay, that's just about right. Um, um, of reinforcement learning to uh, quantum physics. Uh, so, let me show you a related but slightly different version of a quantum control problem, but the idea is basically very simple. So what you have um, is you have a, uh, sing a single qubit again, uh, which in this case you always initialize uh, in the green state, and what you want is you want to transfer the population into the red state, into the so-called target state. And you want to transfer the population by following time evolution, um, um, by uh, using time evolution following the Hamiltonian H of T, um, which has a constant uh, energy splitting uh, Z uh, and an external magnetic field H. So what you want to do here is you uh, want to find the optimal external field H, say a magnetic field, uh, and then as you vary the field, your uh, system is going to evolve according to this Hamiltonian, and you want to evolve the system in such a way that you transfer the population from the green arrow to the red arrow. What you measure again is uh, the overlap squared, so the fidelity of, of being um, in the target state. And, okay, so in principle you can use any time-dependent function H of T, um, but uh, for simplicity we decided to look uh, at a smaller space of functions, so we're going to look at the piecewise constant protocols. So these protocols take only two values. Um, the values can be either plus one or minus one. I'm sure there's something wrong here with the image, but basically uh, there's, you know, here on the x-axis there's, there's the time axis, um, then you discretize the time axis into some fixed time steps, delta t, and then at every time step uh, on the y-axis here, the blue curve is actually such a, an example of a piecewise constant protocol H, and this protocol can take only two values, positive four um, or negative four. And then at every step, your agent has to decide you know, whether to take a positive or negative value. If you think about it for a second, uh, there, if you have like n of those steps, then there are two to the n, so exponentially many of these sequences, so it's not so easy to actually find, um, find the right one. But what I want to um, show you now is a movie of the learning process that we have um, um, of this agent. And so what you see here uh, is uh, you know, how the system evolves with an agent that doesn't know anything. You see these zigzaggy curves. These zigzaggy blue curves come because uh, you know, the control field is, uh, is, is piecewise con uh, constant, right? Uh, it turns out that this is not that crucial. So out of the space of all piecewise constant protocols, um, um, there are also optimal ones. There's something which is called Pontryagin's maximum principle, uh, which essentially guarantees this. But um, the important thing, or the important parameter here is in the lower left corner, which is the number of training episodes. So you see after about five training episodes, it reaches a reward of about 0 .90, uh, 0 0.91 or 0.94, um, and then it progressively becomes um, better, so it, it improves over time, and um, um, you'll see that um, in a second, uh, that it requires you know, a number of training episodes. Of course, this training happens much faster than, uh, than, than the movie that I'm showing here, right? Um, but I think after about like 14,000 or, uh, or, or 15,000 episodes, it's actually going to find you know, the optimal solution. And here already, after 10,000 episodes, let's say, it finds something very interesting. It brings the state, it learns to bring the state to the equator. That's the optimal y, by the way. It, brings to learn the, uh, to, to, it learns to bring the state to the equator for as long as optimal, and then eventually departs direction the target state. And this is actually uh, interesting because the equator um, is uh, the only geodesic about the z-axis on the sphere, and as we know, geodesics are curves of shortest distance. So if you want to go from you know, one point on the sphere to another point on the sphere, then you'd better find you know, uh, the shortest path. What is interesting, though, is you know, with this definition of piecewise constant uh, fields, you cannot turn off the X field, right? So you cannot turn off the uh, X field and say, let me just drift along, along the geodesic. So what it has to learn to do, and this is what it does, is it does this, you know, up, uh, these banks up and down, uh, eventually to, on average, cancel the field so that it can keep it 
uh, on the equator. So that's basically what, what, what it learns here. That's interesting thing. Okay, um, I wanna give a few other examples of applications of reinforcement learning this time, less detailed. So this is an example by uh, a group uh, in Erlangen uh, where they considered a system of uh, three qubits shown here in blue exposed to a noisy environment. And then there's a fourth ancillary, ancillary qubit, red, which is a qubit that they can measure. So this goes back to, you know, what do you do like with, uh, uh, with these measurements? Uh, so what their agent was doing is their agent was measuring the state of this ancilla and then based on a, sim a similar policy gradient type algorithm, um, it was learning how to control the rest um, um, of, the, of the blue uh, qubits in such a way that um, uh, their state is prevented uh, from decohering or protected uh, from, from decoherence. So that's the idea. And what you see here on the right is essentially such a sequence. And it turns out that these sequences are essentially error correction code. So here the agent without any knowledge comes up with some very simple though, but uh, an error correcting code. Um, and there are um, other examples more, um, you know, sophisticated. If someone has heard the buzzwords of, uh, um, you know, the Tori code or the surface code, like one can play these games there um, as well. But another um, application uh, um, that I want to show is the design of quantum gates. So as I mentioned, quantum gates, which usually look something like these rectangles, um, are the basic building blocks of quantum circuits that uh, this is how you operate, you know, with quantum computing devices. Um, and in particular, a very interesting gate here is the so-called cross-resonance gate because this is a gate that brings in quantum entanglement. And it's the quantum entanglement that would one day hopefully give the advantage of a quantum computer compared to a classical one. And what you do in theory is you can you know, model your uh, qubits and then you can uh, you know, come up with these uh, theoretical uh, electromagnetic pulses that they actually apply on their physical qubits in the lab in order to realize um, physically, the cross-resonance gate. Um, and then what um, um, these guys um, have done um, uh, is they used reinforcement learning in order to, uh, to improve on the theoretical uh, curves. And indeed, you know, the agent gave them like this weird zigzaggy uh, pulses, and it was not clear, you know, what these zigzaggy pulses are doing, but then if they actually compare the error rate or the so-called infidelity, so the smaller this number, the better, um, um, uh, the gate is, then the theoretical one on you know, current IBM devices has an infidelity of about 10 to negative two, and you get about almost an order of magnitude better um, using reinforcement learning. If you are able to get just one more order of magnitude uh, here, so 10 to negative four, then you would reach this fault tolerance uh, limit, um, these devices. And last, uh, the last example is the design of variational quantum circuits. Um, so these are now, you know, this is what you do with these gates now. You basically uh, stack them, you know, next to each other um, in the form of a circuit. And you can use reinforcement learning in order to optimize these circuits variationally in two ways. Um, and the one way what you do is you try to find the continuous value of this uh, um, gate parameter, this gate angle or time, if you wish. Um, but you keep the structure of the, uh, of the circuit fixed. Um, so as you can see, it kind of repeats. But you can, what you can also do uh, is you can actually try to find the optimal structure and find the angles. So basically, there is a combination of a discrete and continuous optimization problem, basically how to, how to order these gates um, in an optimal way. Because no one tells you that this sequence here has to be the optimal one. There might be better ones. And you can use you know, reinforcement learning and Monte Carlo tree searches and all these other uh, types of uh, machine learning algorithms that you guys are familiar with in order to uh, do this. All right, with this, I'd like to come uh, uh, to the last slide. Uh, so I just wanna mention for those of you who are interested in learning a little bit more about how this works. If you're not familiar with, first of all, you know, on deep learning, there's a very nice, already I think maybe outdated, but still interesting from the perspective of a physicist book uh, about neural networks by uh, Michael Nielsen. Then the standard textbook on reinforcement learning is the Sutton and Barto. Um, um, and then I would also recommend a set of online lectures by uh, Sergey Levin at UC Berkeley, and I also gave a lecture course in Sofia a couple of years ago, uh, and you can find here the URL. Uh, yeah, all right. With that, I'd like to thank you for the attention. Yes. And I was wondering if there's any reason to expect that something like this to happen, like the way that the wavelength is really, I mean, it's not
number of steps. The number of steps you should be avoiding to converge, or is there any intention of the algorithm to go towards the other two solutions, or can you understand this in such silos where I do have an intention to converge? Uh, so, okay, as I uh, you know, was already pointed out, you know, uh, this simple problem that I showed um, um, is you know, too simple. So in that case, if you tune the parameter regime, there's a single solution, and then it better find that solution, right? But what we actually did in that study is we varied, for instance, the uh, duration of this control protocol, so the duration of the sequence. And what you observe there, quite interestingly, is that you can actually have a series of phase transitions as you vary um, um, the, uh, this physical parameter. So um, what happens is the optimization landscape reorganizes and it can actually change its structure completely. And you can go from a case where you have you know, a single solution to a case where you have many solutions that are almost the same but not quite. So something that, something like, it's a rugged landscape. Uh, for the single qubit, it's not quite a glass, but if you actually put a few more qubits together, you let them talk to each other, then it becomes as complicated as a, as a thin glass. And you can actually show that. it will go to a local minimum. And you have no guarantees of getting the global minimum. There is no magic here. <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, people have uh, explored the so-called quantum reinforcement learning. Um, what they understand uh, under these are agents that actually run on the quantum devices. Um, and they're supposed to run on the quantum devices because these devices are actually quite noisy still. Um, but the idea there is that um, anything that a quantum computer can offer you as an advantage, as a computational advantage, those agents would have. And there are peculiarities into how you interact with these systems, um, um, you know, measurements and then extracting information from them, et cetera. Um, um, which uh, you have to take into account in order to revise, you know, the classical reinforcement learning algorithms. Perfect. We wait for Ludwig. 